Hey, and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. This month, we've got a four-part series featuring the Swing Whisperer, Doug Latta, and everyone's favorite follow on Twitter, Greg Hyatt. In each episode, we'll also have accompanying videos on YouTube with the links posted below. In episode two, I join in on the discussion with Craig and Doug, and we break down the impact of balance and leveraging the power and abilities of the human body, and we also talk about how to break bad habits that are hurting hitters. Here is episode two featuring Craig Hyatt and Doug Latta. Craig? Back here at the board, we're going to talk a little bit more about balance, but I think it's really important. Craig has done so much for the industry that he just never gets his thanks for, and I can never say thanks enough. Keep doing what you do. But I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce the third party that's here with us today who does the same thing. He runs a podcast. He's a coach at a high school, and he is just busting on behalf of a lot of baseball players through this nation. And I'd like to bring Jonathan Jellner into the equation. Thanks, appreciate you. It's good. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Jonathan runs a podcast and he, he interviews coaches and he's amassed an incredible amount of information and he's exchanging it around with one intent to make players better. And these two gentlemen are doing things that you know I respect and admire and just keep doing keep doing it. And Jonathan's idea was people need to see more of kind of these thoughts that were generated and. Well, uh, here it is. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank Thanks, you, Jonathan. Uh, absolutely. The mastermind behind all this. And, right, right. Well, getting um, Doug here is incredible. Right. Thanks for having us out. And oh. It's two no better baseball guys out there, really, that, that are for the game. And so we, we did the podcast, and then there were people asking us, you know, how, how it just audio is, it's, it's good, but how are you doing this stuff? And so we're, we're about to talk a little bit about balance, and that's kind of the intro to everything that you talk about. I, I don't know how many times that word's been used uh, this weekend. But I've just, got to, everybody knows I will admit to I have a very strong bias for balance. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's elemental to the way bodies move, how we're athletic, effective, and efficient. And so my bias is always going to be looking at how the body's moving. Is balance involved? Is there imbalance involved? And in my reckoning, balance also involves other things like we've talked about eyesight timing so i kind of see it as one big picture that ties together and it's always the body works better from a position of imbalance of balance mm -hmm. the body works better from a position of balance if there's imbalance there's no way the body works as effectively as it does it's not stronger and it's not more efficient so balance what do you think about balance well it's you know we say it all the time but, but what is it? Yeah, what to achieve it? So what is it, and why? And I think we blow it off, like because we've heard it, but it's like, yeah, yeah, we want balance. Okay, what does it really look like? How do you get to it? Why does it help you? What happens when you're out of it? How do you train it? But that once you really get it and understand what it does for you, it opens up the timing, like we talked about, and the vision, and it's, it's about the body. The other thing is, you know. When you can get a hitter to work in balance or to understand balance and work in better balance or work towards a better balance, the immediate changes in success go through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and again, I think that defines why we focus on balance, why I have this incredible obsession and bias towards balance, because I've seen every time that we clean balance up, we see game changing kind of effects at the plate in game situations mm -hmm. because the hitter is just working more balance, which means in concert with their body. And we, we contradict ourselves because we say balance, but then we say back. Mm -hmm. oh, so are we being back balance or are we back? Are we moving? So like we, we use these words and we like them, but then they contradict each other. 
So moving to balance is not a traditional way of being back. And when you're back, you're out of balance. And if you're stacked back, if you're all your weight, that weight has to go somewhere. And, and when it goes, it's going to be lost and the energy is going to be lost in the wrong direction when we have to try to hit the baseball. And so we can't say we want balance and, and staying back all the time. Together at the same time, Redefine. That's what, what is a hitter like? Okay, I got to stay back, but you like being being balanced. So what is that? What's the in between of those two things? Well, it's controlling a move, and we can just actually just eliminate saying stay back. Mm-hmm. You can just get rid of it. Just be in control of your body as you move to balance, and then hit from there. And you can eliminate the beauty of what Doug has showed me. Is we can eliminate a lot of words, a lot of concepts, just get to a good spot and work from there. And everything kind of falls in line after that. Mm-hmm. And then it's just everything has become a lot easier. If we don't work in balance, we're we're grinding. We've talked about the grind. It's a dog fight. And then it's really show like, that grind move. Uh, the biggest grind move is we're always going to go to our shoulders. Yeah. Our upper body is going to take over. And remember, our strongest muscles are here. Yeah. And if we make a shoulder move, these muscles are not part of it. And we're working against them. But generally, let's say a hitter gets rushed, even a hitter in balance gets rushed or surprised. There I go to my shoulder, which pre sermons that I'm now up here. I'm going to have to come off plane and I'm not going to have the length in the zone that I want. Other hitters are just taught because of bad moves. It's always a grind. And I'm seeing a phenomenal number of young hitters and even some professional hitters make big grindy moves with shoulders, which are career enders because I'm not using my lower half well, and I'm not going to cover my zone. I have to cover a zone at, you know, obviously a younger hitter maybe can become fastball selective, but as you evolve in the game, as you move up in the game, you've got to cover and you've got to have adjustability. When we talk about that grind, that grind takes away all adjustability. And it takes away my athleticism. Which is totally opposite. For when we say, man, he swings, he has a smooth swing and it's easy. Well, he's not grinding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's effortless. Yeah. He moved through alignment and balance and he pulled off a, a clean, fast swing because he didn't have to work hard to get out of imbalance. Right. And so the grind is that I'm out of ba- balance and I got to fight to get back to where I should be. And then I got to work really hard. And as I try to work really hard, I'm coming off the line in the baseball. It's really being inefficient. Yeah. Terribly yeah. inefficient. Yeah. Well, wouldn't a grind also be the back shift? Absolutely. Would that be part of the grind? What we look at is, as a lot of people know, I'm, again, balance oriented. And I any back shift is going to take me out of balance. Any back shift means my pelvis is moving. Any back shift means I'm probably putting weight over my backside. Mm-hmm. And once I do that, I will never get to good balance. I may compensate and think I get there, but there's going to be other movement-based issues that aren't going to work in my favor. But if I can, and again, one of the things is by just getting athletic and make sure I can make a move forward without a back shift, things get very simple. The other thing is with the back shift, people forget as well as not, am I taking my my pelvis and my base off, off key? My head's moving back too. My eyes are moving back. So what I want to do is set an athletic position, hold that posture, and make a move to the ball where everything can stay together. Mm-hmm. My eyes stay very stable. But now I'm trying to adjust and make other moves. Visually, my timing is absolutely compromised when I move back. Sure. And so is my balance. And you do this. And then most definitely when I get to, we call it a pedestal now, because the human body, the human body likes to work in a pedestal. As we're standing, you'll find we sit on one leg or the other yeah. mm-hmm. because that way we can support the weight. But when I get onto a pedestal, now my body really can't make a move because it's in neutral or being used. So it's going to find something else to create a move. And usually it's going to be an upper body. It's going to be an upper body move that I'm going to try and move to now go forward. But once I do this, it becomes a front side move and my front side attacks the ball. I get a sense of rushing or falling to the ball. And once that comes down, I'm going to come off plane mm-hmm. because there's no backside control. There's no backside swing. Everything is being dragged forward. And the upper body generally is making the move. 
or what I want to do in balance is work the whole backside through so my posterior chain can follow the contact point. And then everyone yells at the kid for, you know, pulling their head out. Well, that started probably at this move mm -hmm. because now I went here and I got forward and I got in and now I got to fight myself out of it. And then Good that shit. is all of a result. And then we tell kids to keep their head in there. Well, no, you learn how to move right. And you'll never have that, you know, come off like that. Well, a lot of, a lot of kids, you hear get into the ground a lot, right? Yes, but what does that mean? It just means you putting force into the ground yeah. and not back. Yeah, so now, do that move again. Uh, go. This one right here. Yeah. So, th so this is what this is what my interpretation of getting into the ground was because you're you're wanting to put force into that and carry yeah. it forward, right? Yeah. But it doesn't have to be over. And so yesterday when we were working together, I I didn't even realize that I was back shifting, I, and I I don't do it bad like a lot of our kids do and get really back. But I was trying to get into my hip, and that was causing me to go back. So yeah, and you had all these other effects on your balanced plane. I did, yes. Shoulder twisting right. in, and although you'd done it a while or worked from that you know, criteria for a bit, you were able to kind of get a swing off. Mm -hmm. But later we did some work, and we'll probably show uh, a little bit later mm -hmm. some of that work. Sure. At the end of the day, what was the difference in how you felt in your swing? I was easy. I was relaxed. I, I didn't realize how tense I was with my upper body and I'm a stocky guy. And so like I was getting here and I, I'm already in a bad balance position because my shoulder, my front shoulder is pointing to the second base. Yeah. So I'm already here and I've got short arms, which is part of it. But growing up, I was, I was griffy, right? I mean, yeah. I was up here. And so that already is taking me offline and you just kind of set me up and we coach guys out of the back move all the time. But it's you're not telling not to get in the ground because you you no, use that certain term ground. several times. Yeah. But it was just so much easier to do so from that. I and want to carry. I want the ground underneath me here. I want to really feel my. I want to feel the inside part of my back here. I want to feel this underneath mm -hmm. me. But more importantly, when I make that move to the ball, I want to feel it right there. Because mm -hmm. when I get to this fifty fifty, I want that ground. That's where my power. That's where the energy is. That's going to be translated through the kinetic chain sure. all the way up the ladder into my path. And when I've got that, oh, it's a good feel. Okay. But most kids don't have any concept of that because if you think about all the training we've been doing, or kids are like force fed, literally, like it's dip everything, their toes. yeah, load back, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get that barrel of the ball. And from that point forward, these players are compromised. Mm -hmm. they're, they're absolutely hamstrung. You know, as we talked about, one of the things that I think is elemental is everybody thinks about trying to get the barrel on the ball. Yeah. So I wanted to get, okay, let's get to balance, Doug. Okay, we're balanced. Now we're going to get that barrel on the ball. Mm -hmm. Well, where are my shoulders? Okay, so I watch guys talk about, okay, looks good, looks good, looks good. No, that's not what we're going to do. Just release it early and throw it. And what I want to think about is working that line. Mm -hmm. Okay, working that line. Because as I work that line, everything's going to stay through. And I'm actually going to be making contact at the ball and through it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to see contact hit the ball and then exhaust the bat off. I want to see contact and the bat staying on plane with the ball as long as I can. So getting on plane, we talked about a lot. Get on plane in balance mm -hmm. and let this work. But the minute we ever try to control the barrel, and every child is probably taught that, mm -hmm. We're losing balance because we have to turn unathletically to try to do something like this rather than stay balanced and do something like that. So, you know, both of you guys have shared a bunch of stuff that you're doing and I can as well, but how do we get our kids moving better? Because that's where everything starts in Agreed. a position of balance, right? But how do we, how do we help them feel what we're trying to, you know, what we can see? How do we get them to feel that? You know what I want to do? Uh, we were talking about a tennis drill, mm -hmm. and that made a lot of sense because I really think tennis and actually throwing are the best ways that really exemplify how our body should move when we hit. Craig, do you mind showing the, the tennis drill? Starting with that, we talked about a tennis drill that I absolutely loved. Let's show that. Okay. Okay? All right. So what we do is we'll, we'll have a tee out in front, and what I noticed through tennis is 
They'll choose to do a backhand or they'll choose to get around and use the forehand. And a lot of times they'll go cra- uh, cross court. So they have to be able to maintain their balance and move. But then they're going to have this line of direction to make sure that they can get the ball where they want to go. So we try to copy that. And it forces kids to find out how to maintain their posture and alignment as they move. And then from there, stay on the line. So the goal here is we're trying to hit the ball up into the L screen, just like a cross court in tennis. And so we'll start here in posture. We'll force them to have their hands down, vertical barrel, and they'll find whatever posture they think they should have. And then it's we'll set up a cone, cone, and cone. And it's basically three shuffles. I can do that. So because of the angle of this, you know, we do a lot of drills where we start here, but we already have a line. What we're doing now is we're creating momentum around the corner, and then they really have to fight to keep that line and direction right through there. So kids that naturally come up and out and swing left, they really have to fight to do this drill. So we start right here. Shuffle, shuffle, hit. What you'll notice, too, is this where the scissor starts to come in as they keep their line here. They will naturally hold their posture and alignment through the direction of the ball to get the ball to the L screen. So it's nice having that target, right? You tell them where to hit it. They understand that. But now we got to fight that momentum and then hit. And pretty effective way to get them to feel that idea of that line. Yeah. Now, what else do you see from once it, once you get the hitter in that position? One of the things we see a lot is you know obviously my biases are balance and hand path, which we call the line. Yeah. Direction A to B, working to extension, whatever the case be, but it's a straight line. Yeah. And um, one of the things we've uh, we've done and I've just learned a new progression. What we used to do was called the hockey drill. Yeah. Where we just work underneath and then snap out the hand and just hit the ball. And a great friend of mine has made it a a pretty impressive beginning because most people know how hockey works. He'll put a ball down here and make them just slap shot it in. And then they get that feel that move. And they start, you know, with front toss, with hockey, and you start progressing down and keep kind of snapping it outline down the point where you're here and you're sticking it. Uh-huh. So sticking it, and we love the idea of the, we call it the stick drill. And then, then they get their regular toss, and suddenly they're feeling that that line maintained. But the good thing we like about the hockey drill is also let's more articulate the elbow. Yeah. And we've called it the arenado because I'm able to articulate up to stay in rather than out and around. And this is why the you know, a lot of guys we hear hitters talking about the chalk line. You already have a built-in line there. And that's why I love if you can get cameras on the top view or even, you know, behind is great. We, we don't usually get that, but they have a natural line. And, you know, they're going to have a little bit, but I'll look how long can we stay on that natural chalk line. And you can see it from the top view with the cameras. You know, one of the things we look at on that line, and I love about the top view, and we're going to set that up sometime, is we really hit balls in a line and in a rectangle. And the longer I can, the easier I can get in this, the longer I can stay through the ball in a long zone, which people don't understand. That allows me an incredible amount of play coverage. Right. But then we talk about balance, and we also talk about right ability. Because when we when we get down, we're usually ready for a fastball. Some people can float, carry a little farther when they have good pitch recognition to get a little bit farther, perhaps, before they make an adjustment based on off speed. But we also have the point we call right ability where we're down, but now we have to hold pressure. We're not in the front side, we're behind it. And so we can ride a little bit just to give enough delay that we can yeah. still get off a good swing. Yeah. And one of the things I talk about a lot is hit through spin. Yes. And what people don't understand is backspin is built in hitting through spin. And even if I'm in what looks like an awkward position, 
if I can hit through spin, I'm going to do damage. But most people, because if they make the wrong move, if balance isn't right, they get down and see where those shoulders go. The minute shoulders go, I'm not going to be able to hit through spin. I have to punch at it, around it. I cannot be effective. And you can't check your swing. Either. No way. And plus, the minute I have shoulders, I lose adjustability. Yeah. When I mean shoulders, again, off plane, off balance. Yes. But if I can get in that line, even if I'm over here, I'm not here, but I'm in it where my hips are still somewhat in control. And I've got adjustability. And this is where I'll like, if I talk to stay back, I said, you stay back is here. is here. We're not trying to stay back here. We're going to get off it, but we're going to be behind this and through it. And as we stay back through this, we can have some time adjustability and we're going to stay on the line. The higher we get up in this game, the more adjustability we need. So we think about the whole idea of stay back. But the other thing is there's no way I stay back. If my, my shoulders take over, I cannot stay back. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, gone. Everything I just, can't. I'm done. So now it's just praying I can, can get Can you do that move again? Off. Oh, I hate to. Do I have to? <laughs> yeah. So he just goes right into the, everything's going into the plate. He lost space. He lost uh, control back here. He energy. Lost direction. He lost energy. And now if the ball moves no, or, just, or he wants to shut it down, he can't. He can't. Yeah. So being able to be in here in a good position or being here in a right position, I still have, I have a lot of damage right there. It may not look as athletic as it does here, but here I've got an incredible amount of damage being done. And you have total control of yes. this. Yes. And we've talked a little bit, and I think it's going to come out in tennis too, is that obviously a lot of people look at big moves behind, yeah. which I am categorically against. Stay in balance. And But what we're learning is – that we can do an incredible amount of damage from here because this automatic picks up that whole backside and delivers some incredible body strength through the posterior chain. And it doesn't seem right because everybody's used to trying to get length back here, but that's a separation. Yeah. My top half's done. My legs are done. There's not a lot of good going to happen, but I'm going to try and get the barrel of the ball. But from here, we can do damage. Now, you're talking a little bit about tennis. What did you see? The thing with tennis is, you know, all the bodies are different, so there's variation of how guys create power, but they also need to be consistent. They need to hit the ball in a certain direction, and obviously they're trying to create power, but Federer, who, you know, is one of the greatest tennis players right now, is it's interesting how he is, you know, some guys will have a big move here. He is staying pretty simple right here. He's able to just create his force using his whole body in coordination and getting out here in front and flipping the ball there because he has everything in it, but it's, it's in a direction. You don't need all this. And you think about the travel time between here and here. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go wrong in there. I got to get this back to me, but I also have to figure out how to avoid getting my shoulders engaged from there too. Yeah. Cause I have to get this back in. Yeah. And so if I go out in a way, I got to get this back in, and I got to do it fast. And, and when I try to do something fast last second, grind move. Yeah, grind move. And then that's great if the ball's not moving. Yeah, <laughs> the pitch is coming in. I got to have some integrity with my body to be able to manage the pitch that's moving and 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 adjust. So as that gets farther away, I got to work really hard, a lot harder. And so with. You guys Dismissive don't results. Yeah, and guys don't hit home runs. Say, well, I worked really hard to hit that home run. No, you hit the home run because you were clean and efficient with your body. And when Federer's hitting the ball, however hard he hits it, he's doing it from here. Yeah, he's we, not doing it from there. Well, I think, like I said, as we start by being able, we talk about getting on plane. You know, being at the top of the zone, being able to get into the slot. There's lots of terminology that's used, but it's all the same thing. Yeah. Because I want to get on plane with my hands. Not with my back. My barrel, I don't want to get that back here. But if I get my hands on plane, I'm going to be in a good position to hit out here. But I'm not trying to take the barrel. I'm just getting in here. Right. And I'm going to pick up my whole backside. And it's going to generate more balance and strength through the entire contact point. If my hand's out here, I don't know where my barrel's at. Yeah. When I get it in here, no, exactly. Where it's I at. can feel, I know, and we've used this tool enough. 
I know where my barrel's at because I can feel it, and now I'm supported. And so as you get away here, I don't know where it's at. And so you're trying to find it, and then you got to throw it to find it. Yeah. Now we look at different hitters. We talked about tall hitters, six foot five guys versus five foot seven guys versus five foot. But the bottom line is that range is going to be pretty close. And we want some space. We want a little space because we need space to work in spaces. I don't want to be here. Right. We're not. But I don't want to be here too. So I'm going to find space that works for me, but I also want space here. Yeah. A lot of times I'll just do this. Yeah. I want space. And I want to carry that space. So a lot of times hitters are used to like making cocking moves or letting their hands move back or their shoulders come in. But I said, make space, carry it. And see how quiet my upper body is and how relaxed my shoulders are. And most young hitters and a lot of professional hitters have big shoulder moves. And if we don't get those out of them, they're not going any farther. But again, you get to this point where you're carrying space, you work so much easier and so much effortless yeah. through the zone yeah. without contesting your own body. And we, you know, people talk about what's a com- compact, quick, tight swing. Well, that's the look. That's you just did it. That's the look of what we want. And so, yeah, you can lose a lot of stuff back here. Yeah. What t- let's and you can lose a lot of stuff back here. And to recover from that, I mean, you might you might square up a ball every once in a while, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying yeah. to do it more often. And the key to becoming a good hitter at any level of the game is I've got to have consistency. Yeah. I've got to have consistency. And I know when um, Justin Turner hits a lot of people look at where Justin's positions are, which are somewhat unique to Justin, but he really has a – he's back here. And there's probably very few swings you can say are as consistent as Turner's right? because he's able to – make his move, and do a lot of damage with a very effortless, smooth, consistent swing. And, and, and he covers the plate probably better. Than well, and that's why his two-strike numbers are so good. Do you know what I love the most, too? Is like a good take is magical. Yes. When you take a pitcher's you know, pitch that he's used to spiking and you swing through it, you can show that you can get all the way out here and be halfway full, but then you can shut it down because – you move through here, I can support the barrel and shut it down. Yeah. I cannot shut it here. And so I take in an at bat to get you to two, one, three, one, and you win that one, one count and your take on his best pitch, you're winning the battle. I'll share with you one of the things we're doing. Uh, we did this off season with a lot of our high level, our professional big league hitters is, we talked about getting to a good position and, and continue to build that with posture and moves, but we're also talking about what we call the shut piece. And that means I get to a position, and if I'm a little bit off, for instance, handling pitches are up in the zone, if I get to my position, I feel that my hands are making a move or my shoulders are making a move, shut piece, that's a ball. Yeah. Shut her down. Yeah. And vice versa, if you're used to carrying good posture and suddenly make a move and you break posture, shut piece, that's probably a ball. But the other thing being that at any count, without two strikes, if I don't get down and I don't feel good, I'm not shut her down. The reason is, a lot of times we get to bad position, then we try to affect a swing, even if it's a pitch right down the middle, and, you know, we're 0 for 1. So better to be 0 for 1, or better be to shut piece, be 0 and 1, or 0 and 2, rather than be that at bat's gone. Yeah. So being able to kind of be really... How do you what your body's doing and feel, and then kind of go with it? Obviously, with two strikes, the simplest approach is your swing works. You don't change your swing. You did change your mouth. Get as relaxed as possible and do your job. Go see the ball. Yeah. And you've taken enough swings that when you see a strike, you'll work. And so when you have that good move, you're improving the vision. You're improving your vision to shut it down, but your body's in a position to shut it down. I mean, if you, you throw in... 10, 15 more walks a year because you made a good decision on some pitch and, and, you know, a couple walks here or there over your season, a couple knocks because you got to a better count and you reduce your strikeouts. It doesn't take much. I mean, to change your numbers, change. yeah, change. Well, the other thing you look at, even just being able not to have an 0 for 1 that, you know, darn, ground out to short, I get another shot to do something else. Yeah. And in a leverage situation, that's huge. Yeah. But even in any situation, again, one hit every two weeks at the big league level is 20 points on your average. 
Right. It's not a huge number, but you start thinking about, let's say, what, how am I controlling my bats? And people talk about plate discipline and, and these things, but it all starts with if you don't move in balance, if you don't get to good position, then likely if you really being able to control the plate, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, so a lot of it still ties together all these approaches and, and intangible like thought uh, processes have to be tied to clean move on time. And do you feel like through that you will naturally hit more off speed mid counts, early counts? Absolutely. Let me take a few seconds to tell you guys about On Base U. On Base University is an organization that studies how the human body moves in baseball and softball. They offer certification seminars that teach coaches, trainers, and medical professionals how to assess an athlete's physical ability to perform movement patterns that are specific to hitting and pitching. For example, they just put up a blog post on their website, onbaseu.com, that discussed why hip internal rotation is important in hitting and how they evaluate it with their On Base U screen. If you want to learn more about On Base U, I did a podcast with the On Base U founder, Dr. Greg Rose, episode 78, and he talked about how he modeled the screen after golf assessments that he created for TPI. They are hosting pitching and hitting seminars in Phoenix, Newark, and Houston over the next few months. I will be attending one soon, and I hope to see you there. If you see a, you know, because your recognition, and if you see a pitch, and you're, it's in a zone, you, you can get to it. Because you're in a good relaxed position, you know your swing works, or yeah. should work. But a lot of people will, depends on you know what level of game you're at, but let's go down to the back of the amateurs. How many of them take bad swings at curveballs? Yeah. yeah. And, and once, once the book is out on you that you're doing that, <laughs> the but, data these days, that's, you know. Even high schools are getting a yeah. lot more. Involved in. Oh, they are, and coaches are calling it, and they have a chart over 15 games of you. If you if you were an early freshman sophomore up on varsity, they know who you are. They have a book, and they're watching your playoff games. Mm -hmm. And the key is, but hitters still have to, like I said, there's no time in this game, whether you're high school, professional level, or lower, that you should not be working on kind of the same basic aspects. Now, do I expect a 12-year-old to be as disciplined and understanding of how to handle off speed, not to the level that someone's facing all the time, but being in a better position to kind of understand how to do it, but hit through it. So once we get down to balance, the one key I want and give people is you have to hit the very pitch you see, not at it, not around it, hit through it. And that's where they start learning to, okay, how can I hit through a curveball? Okay, then there's your constraint. Hit through it. And suddenly they start hitting through it. It's like, oh, light goes on. Um, obviously, they're in the high school before they see consistent breaking pitches. Sadly, I have seen younger, you know, players, the amateur level, throwing a lot of spin, which brings in another question about arm length. And, uh -huh. and basically, from point length, how long is it going to last? But as we develop as a hitter, as we get into college ranks, Suddenly, you know, a hitter goes out of high school as a good hitter, gets in college, like, oh, my, this is a different game. Right. Just like a great D1 hitter jumps into professional baseball and goes, oh, my, this is a different game. Right. Just like a double-A moves to triple-A, triple-A moves into the big leagues, mm -hmm. where that's the biggest game change of all. But everything has to be built from the same position. That's why I like train young hitters so they have the same basic moves that they're going to have up the ladder, and their adjustments become you know, internal, and their movements are going to be based upon everything that's efficient mm -hmm. because that's the only way that they can be consistent. You've mentioned a couple times about grinding, but you also, you talk about being a, having a soft entry mm -hmm. into the zone, and I know whenever we did the podcast, people people are asking, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like? Can, do you mind giving us a Well, a once again, thing? and Craig always hits on this too, is that if you don't understand timing, you're going to be grinding. Mm -hmm. Most kids, and there's a lot of stuff putting them out there now, like to overswing, swing harder. Mm -hmm. Because the concept is if I swing hard, I can hit a ball hard, or I can hit a ball far. It's, that's not true. It, in a cage environment, you might be able to do it, but I've seen these cage kids are just seem like they're killing the ball, getting a game, and you know they're going back to the dugout dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. 
But when we think about the grind is generally a hard move and a rush move. We should be able to get on time and just make a soft move. It's not. It's just an easy move in. It's not a big move. It's just easy underneath my shoulders because that will speed up with physics and just with the body movement. But the minute I make a bad move, there's a lot of things that are going to happen that are grindy and aren't going to allow me to have my zone. You know, the younger kids don't have to control the zone because they can get away with things. But as you move up in the game, it gets a lot tougher. Can you show that again, that move, the pull-off? The pull-off? Yeah. The grind? Yeah. I always look at this point of the sh shoulder. It gets really pointy there, and it goes up right away. Up and out. Yeah, and you can just see it right away. When he did the soft move... It's down. Do that again, if you could. Look how the softness... I, I look for softness right here. Mm -hmm. and so all this is relaxed. All this is... And a lot of it is just with the hand placement. Right. So... If you're a guy that has, you know, a lot of guys are comfortable up here, but you have to be able to move from here. Sure. The problem is, is a lot of kids pick this because it looks cool and it feels cool, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. you got to be able to get back. It has to soften. Mm -hmm. If you stay up and you go out, hard move. i got to go there, and then I get pointy right there. Mm -hmm. That's why, like for video, that's what I look for. But if you notice in Doug, when he did it, there was nothing here, and it, there was a softness right. here. Well, the other thing people think that they don't understand is we talked, I think we talked yesterday about how the shoulders will bridge. So even if I have a soft front shoulder, the minute I make a hard shoulder move, see so that bridges? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I have one yeah. bridge, and this is shoulders are slow, and they're never going to leave us on plane. They're not going to allow us to what we need to do. So being able to maintain is not just... You know, like I said, well, I'm going to kill this shoulder. I'm going to lift, and then I make this move. Well, they just bridged. Yeah. So the key is just being able to work underneath and think that idea of working underneath my shoulders rather than let my shoulders dictate. And with your hand. Yeah. Like I was trying to turn the barrel, and you kept telling me yesterday that I was front shoulder dominant and that bottom hand dominant, and I was coming around everything. Mm -hmm. And then the moment that I started focusing on getting a backhand underneath and out, then it just started... Like, my direction was great. My line was great. And I wasn't worried about where it was going because it was jumping. on a direct. Yeah, it was jumping and it was on a direct line to yeah, where it was coming from. The other thing we, we talk about entry is a lot of people, it's not a shoulder move. Mm -hmm. As a lot of people are like, well, there are too much hands. Well, you can never have too much hands if the hands are right. Mm -hmm. And again, what we talk about is whatever you use to conceptualize getting in. Some people use the elbow and maybe that works for them. Some people think maybe the hand maybe works for them. A lot of times I'll use the forearm, maybe that works. Whatever this move is going to be and how that works for the particular hitter is good. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you've got to find what works for that hitter because one hitter says elbow, oh, that's good. Another hitter says that elbow, uh-oh, that's not what I want. Yeah, yeah. Another hitter says hands, like, oh, yeah, that works. And then they'll say hands, it's like, uh-oh, now I'm hitting my elbow. No. Right. So it's a matter of getting them used to that when and being able about, to make that, that, that move. You didn't talk about front elbow. Mm -hmm. You talk about that? Well, like I said, we like I said, and we talked a little bit about you know front arm drills. I will never let a hitter hit any kind of pitch with the front arm, never. All I want them to do is be able to make a move like this, which you can see is just basically we call it a tap drill, but just being able to articulate the bat. And now with a younger hitter, actually any hitter, I would also recommend not using a full size bat. Weight wise, we drop weight with a lighter bat that's about eight ounces lighter. Makes a big difference. And I'm even talking for major league hitters. But we're just trying to make a move. We're not trying to articulate the barrel. I'm basically trying to stay clean in here. And you can't see this on the camera, but he actually, this this mat has a line. He is staying. Go ahead and do that oh. move. He's staying right on that line. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can do the, what we call that, like the hockey we've adjusted now to this move, because that is my grind move. Because let's say I feel that shoulder go at the highest level of the game. I'm going to want that up here because the minute I go off, I'm in trouble. Okay. And right. your barrel was right where you, it was right with you, you held your angles right through there. Yeah. The other thing is that we look at like hand placement and little things the body does. For instance, if my hand's here, go ahead, put your hand here, lead hand. Okay. If you push out, you feel the strain? Yeah. Okay. Keep pushing a lot of strain, huh? Yeah. So if you do this, your body's going to make you do this because there's no strain there. Oh, wow. Okay. So now <laughs> bring the hand here. Oh, any strain? Oh, yeah. So there's a little tiny things that happen, but even one more. If I have my put my hand in this position, go ahead, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my front shoulder. Go ahead, pull it up. Go ahead, give it a yank. Pull it up. Right? All right. Now, what I want you to do is let your elbow move forward three inches and then try to pull your shoulder up. Feel it's, the, it won't do it. It's so clean either. Yeah. Because once it gets here, that front shoulder is doing something different that it's not going to come off plane. So if I can just get a little bit of movement forward, this shoulder can't pull up as easy. So, so if I'm here, it'll yank up. If I'm here, it fights it a little so bit. So clarify it. We talk about getting the hands. You've got to get them in at the right time. Yes. And so we don't want them back. back. We don't want them through too early. We're not trying to outrace our body. We're trying to have them with our body. And that becomes your element. Of but if you get them here, and, and we look at sometimes the hands to the armpit and the hand, you know, try, you talk about the palm up, palm down. Yeah. But it's starting to, like, you know, carve at about the armpit, depending on your anatomy. Yeah. Generally, generally but, we figure there's probably a range for each hitter. But I'm talking even, you know, guys that are 6'5 with what we call, you know, angles and levers, they still need to be in here because if I'm way back behind, then I'm going to have to make additional moves. There's more to go wrong here. There's more to engage upper body moves that are going to take me off the plane. And I might be able to get to balls here, but I want it all. Sure. And understand when I want it all, I mean, I want to be able to foul off a pitch out there. I yeah. want to get another pitch. I want to be able to hit this ball. I want to be able to cover it. And it might be clipping it foul. Yeah. It might be able just putting a real tough change up, you know, doing something with that rather than going around it. Yeah. But it, that move here is 100% what happens back here. Yeah. And what happens back here is 100% what position my body gets into, what's ready to fire, and how is it going to fire. You know, uh, you know I watched a kid hit a home run yesterday. And he got into his shoulder a little, little bit, but because his hands got in on time, he still could stay on his line. And do damage. If he was out, Don't. didn't get in, and went that same shoulder move, there's no way he would hit that ball. So if you can get here, get in on balance, now I got I have freedom to do whatever I want to do with whatever direction the pitch tells me to go in. Plus adjustability. Yeah. We can never and I can shut it down. Time. I can shut her down or at least even take a, a rudimentary swing that allows me to clip a ball yeah. so I just get another pitch. I'm just guessing now. I'm thinking right now, I, you know, tennis players are probably reading where the guy's going or the girl's going, and so they're probably getting here at the last second. I bet they can change their angle. Because they have the freedom to do that. Remember, tennis balls come with some velocity, and they have movement, too. spin, yeah. Absolutely. They're so, like hitting curveballs every time. Yeah. Yeah. Cutter City. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, we, t we talk about all the elements of hitting, and the thing that always makes me shake my head, and I sadly shake my head a lot, is watching how we continue, even in this advanced age of technology. And the most important technology, I believe, is a video camera uh -huh. because that can show a hitter what he's doing or what they're doing. Then you've got other data that can tell them, you know, how our results are doing. But those result data are complete based on how my body's moving and how I'm starting my swing and what's happening early. And we can look at that and then we realize, look at all these young hitters at every level and what are they getting from a developmental standpoint well, so it's pretty bad. I would hope that little league coaches, rec ball coaches, youth coaches, travel coaches, uh, even high school coaches have an opportunity to just kind of think this through a little bit. And generally, now years later, what we do is a little bit more acceptable. But the preconceived notions and the dismissal of only big leaguers can do that. This is how the body works. Mm -hmm. This is how the body works best. But if we're teaching anything but that, are we helping a hitter mm -hmm. or are you hurting a hitter? Right. One of the problems I have, and I'll work with the hitter because I do work with amateurs, and I've literally watched high school coaches shut players down. College coaches, you're never going to play another game if you swing like that. And even though the player's having has made incredible changes, it's tangible. Contact off the bat, everything's better. And they get shut down or, you know, coaches, you know, fight it. 
rather than let's let's see why this is working. You know, maybe we all have our biases. I have my bias. We know it. Balance, <laughs> right? Balance and hand pass. I admit to it. But what makes the player better? My job is to take hitters and try to make them better. And that includes I take some of the best in the world to try and make changes to make them better. So what we need to be able to do is, if we're in the job of teaching, making hitters better, trying to coach up a player, well, we need to be better too. I got better here today. Thanks. Yeah, so right here. Thank you. That's a great place to end it. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. Before you go, I'd love to be able to get in touch with you, and we have several different ways of doing so. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AOTC underscore podcast. You can join the AOTC Coaches Facebook group. And if you want to be a part of the mini clinic emails, both of those links are listed below. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review to help others find and stay ahead of the curve.